Welcome to Who Runs This Park, a podcast where you are invited into the hearts and stories of those who have committed their careers to the protection and preservation of our great national parks. Who Runs This Park aims to be a catalyst for inspiration, highlighting all that goes into managing our national parks and building a sense of appreciation for the invaluable beauty, diversity, and history of our protected lands. Today, we get to hear the story of Eric Leonard, superintendent of the High Plains Group. The High Plains Group covers southeastern Colorado and northeastern New Mexico and has four sites, including Amache National Historic Site, Bent's Old Fort National Historic Site, Capulin Volcano National Monument, and Sand Creek Massacre National Historic Site. Eric relocated to the High Plains this past summer to partake in his third superintendency. Previously, he was superintendent at Guadalupe Mountains National Park in Texas, and before that was superintendent of Minuteman Missile National Historic Site. Eric, welcome to Who Runs This Park. It's a joy to have you here today. Good morning. This is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, let's jump in. A way that I like to start our conversations is... Just by highlighting some of the diversity within experiences and roles in the National Park Service. And so a way I like to talk about that is understanding what one of the more unique situations has been since you've been superintendent. And that, you know, you've been superintendent three times, so it can be pulling from any of those experiences. Well, about six months into my time at Guadalupe Mountains, you know, I moved down, you know, during the COVID pandemic, I mm-hmm. moved from South Dakota to, to West Texas. The rest of my family remained in South Dakota. My oldest was a high school senior. And, and so in May of 2021, you know, Sam is about to graduate. So I have scheduled leave to go up for that high school, you know, big family event and to sell a house, close the house, move everybody to Texas. And that's sort of an immovable object that's coming. We have to do it. And, right. and it's a reminder here that, you know, never doubt the capacity of your park to sort of you know, just be an unpredictable place. The day before I was scheduled to leave for three weeks, a lightning strike fire ignited oh, in the man. wilderness in the Guadalupe Mountains. And, and so in that that day, everyone knew I was getting ready to leave. I designated an acting superintendent, but we started to pivot and you know, we're building at the moment in that first day. That fire is, it's an acre, it's a couple mile, you know, it's about a quarter mile maybe up the slope from the wilderness campsite. It's inside a, you know, a five-year-old fire scar from the previous major fire in the park. The fire cycle in the Guadalupe Mountains tends to be about every five years there's okay. something. And okay. you know, although since I've left, they had a wildfire that sort of breaks mm. that curve a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And and so in, as I'm getting ready to leave, I, you know, the, we're starting to build an incident command system structure to cover the fire and you know, whatever's going to happen. And I look at my acting superintendent. He becomes the incident commander. You know, I've been there about six months. And so this is a exercise in trusting your team. Mm-hmm. And I was participating in those initial briefings. And then I just looked at Mike and said, good luck. You know how to get a hold of me. And I drove to South Dakota. <laughs> and three weeks later, and I'm during all those other things, I would occasionally check in. And I, I was reading emails, but right. I wasn't interfering because I wasn't there. And when we get back on June 1st, the, or right before June 1st, the fires, you know, over 2,000 acres, there's almost 100 firefighters between the low front country area and up, then up in the wilderness. Oh, and, man. You know, by the time I got there, it had peaked and it had come. The fear was, and, and the management we were doing was to keep it up in the high country, because if it came low, there was fear that it would you know, get into you know, sort of scrub brush. And a, a note about the Guadalupe Mountains, this is a park and an environment in far west Texas that is deservedly notorious for its winds. Yes. Had the fire got low to the highway, and, and there's precedent in the fire history of the last 40 years, that fire could have burned into New Mexico within a couple of hours. Wow. And nobody wanted that. And and so I got that I got back from that leave right. and got to participate in the demobilization of the fire. And it and well and then the this the funny synergy of you know a, you know, a life and then sort of looking backward. So June 1st, 2021 is the last day of the fire. We've, okay. we've got it managed. It's essentially treed out in really rugged ridges. We've used... What do you mean by treed out? 
it was up on ridges and it's okay. It had, we'd managed it to the point where there were stumps and certain old trees that were, right. were still smoldering, but it wasn't, the fire wasn't moving anymore. And it was in a place where there wasn't a lot of fuel. Okay. And, and so on that day, you know, as we're demobilizing the incident team and starting to send firefighters home, one of the last things we did was that myself and the incident command, we got in a helicopter and flew over wow. the top of the, wow. the park. And, and that was the first time I did that. You know, I, I was, I'm an avid hiker, so and six months in, I hadn't been everywhere, but I had a pretty good sense of you know, the key landscapes. Seeing it from the air was really humbling because you get a sense of just how rugged the place is. Yeah. And you know, where the stumps that were still, so we'd had infrared cameras on airplanes. So we had a sense of sort of where the burning places were. Right. Those were ridges where you know, I would never send a human being to fight a fire because yeah. it's just very steep, very really dangerous. And Well, and I learned that, and I've shared this in other interviews, but I mean, it was not a big situation, but my sister and I were backpacking in Mount Rainier and there had been wildfire smoke in the Cascades. And it was a very humbling experience for us because it kind of made us realize that we needed to plan for and account for like fire safety and evacuation if it were to come. Cause we, like we, you know, we didn't have any service and it was totally fine and the fire wasn't even near us, but we just were like, my gosh, like we don't have a way to know if we need to be evacuating and stuff like that. And then after the fact we were researching and like understanding essentially if you're backpacking, what do you do? from a fire perspective and just learning that it actually travels faster up ridges. And so I could see that being another factor of why maybe you aren't sending people to the ridges because that's actually, I thought surprisingly not knowing a lot about how fire travels, um, that yeah. it travels very quickly. The other thing about that June 1st, 2021 date was that was the 30th anniversary of my high school graduation. And so mm -hmm. I had this moment in the, in the helicopter thinking, huh, 18 year old me would not, would not have thought this was possible. Yeah, right. But to what you just said about being in the wilderness with the fire. So the other part of that first 36 hours of operations, as I was leaving, we knew there was a fire. We, we our you know, first act was to start to close portions of the park. Right. And, and that the focal point of that was the wilderness. Because, the people in the back country. <laughs> yeah. And, and so we used interagency resources as right. our you know, term of art. And what, what does that mean? Firefighters from the Lincoln National Forest immediately mm. north of us in the Guadalupe district out of Carlsbad, New Mexico. And, and, and so a couple of guys in the middle of the night start hiking the Tejas Trail, which is sort of the, it's the more south route that goes straight through through Guadalupe Mountains. And they were, because we had, this is why you manage parks. And, you know, a note here, you know, we think of national parks as wild places and they are, but they're also managed. And yeah. so we had a list of who's in the back country and where they're camping. And, and our goal was to get them out and get them to safety, you know, out of an abundance of caution. And, yeah. you know, one of the other ironies here, you know, so this is spring of 2021, we're still sort of in the pandemic operations right, right. and through may of 2021 almost you know something like 80 percent of guadalupe mountains national park was closed to the public mckittrick canyon the freehold ranch dog canyon you know mm. the entire wilderness but the pine springs campground the pine springs visitor center and the trail to guadalupe peak remained open mm. we set an all-time record of visitation wow 80 percent of the park closed we set all-time record. And, and that says some profound things about how people use parks. Right. You know, the most popular trail was open. Therefore, you know, in many respects, things proceeded as normal. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I've been thinking about this since you were talking about the surrounding area and the flat plains and how the fire could have spread. And to contextualize, um, I grew up in Austin and growing up, most spring breaks, we would actually drive to Colorado, sometimes New Mexico to go skiing. And so I have lots of experience driving through... <laughs> <laughs> the landscape of West Texas. And um, yeah, it's just for folks who aren't familiar, it's like flatter than, granted, I haven't spent much time in Nebraska, Iowa areas, but I mean, yeah, it's, we would count the number of tumbleweeds we saw being blown across by the wind. So I imagine if the tumbleweeds are being blown, the, the like fire also is quite likely to, if it gets yeah. to that location, spread pretty rapidly. Uh, but yeah, that's, I kind of, I like the juxtaposition of noting that like the day you're in the helicopter surveying the park and understanding the fire impact and all those things is like your uh, anniversary of graduations. And yeah, a little bit of a chance to look back and be like, wow, yeah, I didn't, you know, no one 
I don't know if anyone, maybe some people are like, I knew I wanted to be surveying things in helicopters, but that wasn't something I was thinking about as an 18 year old. So that's a cool experience. Taking a step back and understand what led you to where you are in researching. I saw that your father was actually a seasonal ranger naturalist in Yellowstone. So I'd love to hear a little bit about that and what your experience was like growing up in and around the park service and if that kind of directed your path. Oh, it, it had a foundational influence. Yeah, the first seven summers of my life were spent in Yellowstone National Park as a ranger kid. And so that was normal. Right. And let me acknowledge, however, that a childhood in Yellowstone is a pretty strange thing. It, it's the 1970s, and so no television. You're living in, for three months at a time, you're living in apartments in the middle of the park. Dad was duty stationed at Canyon Village, so sort okay. of smack dab in the center of the park. And the summer I was five, as a family, we hiked over 200 miles you know, on Dad's days as off. five year old, oh my gosh. Yeah. And well, you know, one measure of that and the truism of the big parks is the moment you're about a mile off the pavement, you have the place generally to yourself. And so I've seen parts of Yellowstone that most people never see. And and I did that as a very small child. And I was we lived in the part of the park that is not defined by geysers. It's defined by valleys, trees, and then the Yellowstone River and the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. Mm. And one of the jokes here is that at four or five years old, there's a spot as you come in from West Yellowstone, you're about two miles away from Ca Canyon Village and Canyon Junction. You come around a curve and start to go down a hill and you can see it all in front of you. And at four or five, we weren't in Yellowstone until we hit that spot. Oh, interesting. You've been in Yellowstone for about an hour. Yeah. But... You know, it's a reminder, you know, even in a big place, children, you know, define their worlds pretty small. Yeah. My dad was a junior high life science teacher for 30 years. And as a graduate student at the at Washington State University in the late 60s, he his master's thesis advisor was a, a man by the name of Bob Jonas. And Bob was a seasonal ranger at Yellowstone, primarily at Fishing Bridge from okay. the, well, Canyon in the 1950s, you know, from about 1952 to about 1978 or 79. And okay. Bob was a surrogate grandfather of mine. And a note here, you know, the seasonal rangers that worked with my dad and some of the permanent rangers that worked with my dad, they were my first heroes. Yeah. And that's cool. I just, I kind of worshiped some of them. And, you know, it's a, at the beginning of my career, you know, 20 years ago, most of them started to retire in the late 90s and early 2000s. And, and I had the opportunity more than once to sort of to say to them on their last day, you know, you were really important to me. You're the reason I'm here. And that's cool. You know, one of one of those rangers was was my direct supervisor at, in my most of my time in South Dakota. And his name was Mike Flom. He ended his career as superintendent of Badlands National Park. And that's, it's a humbling thing to be supervised by someone you, you know, you strongly admire as a child, because yeah. what you learn, among oh many gosh. other things, is they're humans too. <laughs> I mean, I think that's like getting older. You learn that with your parents, with your grandparents. You're like, wait, what? And for those who are not familiar, so South Dakota is where the Minuteman Missile National yeah. Historic Site is, and then that's also where Badlands National Park is. Yeah, and, and the two parks are grouped together administratively because Minuteman Missile, and we'll talk more about this, but it. Oh, they're Missile, grouped together? Yeah, yeah. Badlands and, and Minuteman? And, oh, I didn't Minuteman know that. Minuteman Missile is three sites along Interstate 90. And, and so the headquarters for Minuteman Missile is, it's nine miles from the headquarters for Badlands. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, my office windows had you know, a really fabulous prairie view with. Interstate 90 in the foreground, but in the background, Badlands Formation. It was a nice place to do some work. <laughs> yeah, that's not too shabby. I guess I'd love to hear how having that exposure to, I guess, Yellowstone National Park, it sounds like y'all would just be there during the summer, but yeah. at what point did you kind of look at all these people you were interacting with and looking up to and be like, I want to be in the Park Service? It took a while. You know, yeah. 
I, my parents were from were Western Kansas. I grew up in Eastern Washington State. They, in the late 1960s, they got married and got the heck out of the plains. So they exchanged flat wheat country for wheat country at a 50 degree angle in Eastern Washington. And a lot of my adolescence was defined by road trips from Washington State to Kansas. Nice. And in the midst of that, you know, how do you keep two boys entertained when you're doing a two or three day drive? The choice my parents made was we started hitting national parks and museums. And so we went huh. crazy out of the way. Mesa Verde is on the way from Washington to Kansas. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mount Rushmore. No, it's not. But and, and at a certain point as a teenager, my mother kind of looked me in the eye and said, OK, this this thing we do, normal families do not go to national right. parks or museums. They go to fun places. Well, I was steeped in it. And as a as a, a boy, actually, probably my, my favorite national park as a kid was Grand Course Ranch National Historic Site, which mm. is north of, of Yellowstone. It's on the Interstate 90 corridor and it preserves the headquarters of what was once well, a massive free range ranch. Oh, and cool. The National Park Service maintains cattle there, and you have buildings that date to the 1860s. And, and it was a working ranch into the mid 20th century. And for me, it sort of it started to redefine what national parks are. A national park can be a ranch. And, right. and that's kind of wild. <laughs> Yeah, that's part of like this journey. I, you know, I'm spending a lot of time on the national parks themselves, but I'm also just through interviews and conversations learning about the diversity within the park service. And I think it's interesting that you not only went to national parks, but went to other historic sites because... It looks like in your experience thus far, my understanding is that you pursued a master's in public history. And then a lot yeah. of the parks you actually worked at seem to have more of like the National Monument or historic yeah. site spin. So I would love to hear, you know, did you find yourself more intrigued by the historical aspects of that? Oh, absolutely. And I, in the first quarter of the 21st century, the strength, the greatest strength of the national park system is at 425 units, quite frankly, there's starting to be something for everyone. It's not simply the natural sites, it's cultural sites. And there's almost something for every single interest. And, right. and that's in a free society, in a complex representative democracy. That's, there's a lot of value in that people can find a place that, that is meaningful to them. Or, or they can find that themselves and their families or their stories represented in the national park system. You know, so you know, my parents got out of Kansas as young adults, and 25 years later, they, they didn't particularly appreciate the irony that I did the reverse. Yeah. And as a 20-year-old, my grandparents were in their 80s. They were starting to pass, and I'd spent some time with them. And, and so at 20, year, at 20 years old, as I finished a community college in Port Angeles, Washington, home of Olympic National Park, that's not a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> And you're like, hmm. I studied up at her in the Hurricane Ridge Lodge. That was a good time. Not too shabby. And so I'm you know, moved to Kansas to figure out what's next with a, a young bride. And that's essentially 30 years ago. And my first year or so in college, I went through three majors in a single year. You know, started with journalism, switched to English, switched to history. And then I find myself in Western Kansas, near where my parents grew up. And related to that, Fort Larned National Historic Site is my, my dad's parents grew up within about 20, 20 to 30 miles of Fort oh, Larned. Wow. And I was attending Fort Hayes State University, which is the only four-year school in the western two-thirds of the state of Kansas. And I'm a third-generation graduate of that school. I start to drift toward becoming a seasonal ranger. And a note here, my father having been a seasonal, he was never going to be a park ranger. He was a teacher. He was doing park rangering as something on the side. I say this ironically, and let me stress first, my parents were incredibly supportive. But in the early 90s, like, I want to be a park ranger. And my dad, you're never going to get a permanent job. Yeah. You, know, you need to, what's your goal here? You're yeah, never like, going to get a permanent that's job. That's great, but like, <laughs> what's plan B? Yeah. In 19, 1999, we shift everything and I moved from Western Kansas to Western Arkansas and started a, a student position at Fort Smith National Historic Site as a park ranger. And that's when, do that, I, I was a couple of years out of 
undergraduate school, I was this close to having everything, all the student loans paid off. And I jumped back into grad school at the University of Oklahoma. And you'll appreciate this. My, my parents, Western Kansas, born and raised. I'm telling them the plan in 1999. Yeah. And my, my mother's quiet for like 30 seconds. And then the first words out of her mouth, Oklahoma, why? <laughs> <laughs> and for context, Eric and I were talking before. So I went to the University of Texas. So I told him we have some beef to... Um, <laughs> discuss because for those who aren't aware, I think UT and OU, University of Texas and o University of Oklahoma are, I would say, the biggest rivals in the U.S., but, you know, that's, yeah. that's my, like, being a diva perspective. Um, so I, your mother and I would get along in that sentiment. I'd be like, what? Yeah. Why? So was it close to Arkansas or that just Arkansas was where you were before? I mean, I know they're close to each other, but I don't know if it's, could you be commuting between the two? This feels weird now. It was a distance learning master's program through oh. the College of Liberal Studies. And so progressive. one of the other rangers that at Fort Smith at the time was in the same hiring authority as a student doing the same program. You know, once a year, I was on campus for about two weeks. Where I was starting was as a historic interpreter, volunteering at state historic sites, working at Fort Larned. And a lot of what I did is you know, what we term living history. And what you do when you're doing living history is you're wearing a historic costume, clothing of the past. You're portraying someone from the past. And the, in the 90s, you know, the most common articulation of this is Civil War reenacting. Okay. It's you know, a very important distinction. What the Park Service does not particularly reenact in the common sense and the one of the big policy red lines is many of the historic parks the national park system are civil war battlefields or revolutionary war battlefields or mexican war battlefields or indian wars battlefields or sites of great tragedy right when you, you know, while we allow living history what we do not allow is opposed fire battle reenactments because a there's some safety concerns, but wait a what? A post fire? A post fire without bullets, you're shooting guns oh, at each oh. other. Yeah. Why do we not allow that? Because on that ground, Americans actually shot at each other and yeah. died. Yeah. And fake war in a place where real war happened is you know the line between respectful and disrespectful moves really fast. Also, if you're using replica weapons, you're putting modern stuff on top of archaeology yeah. or moving things and you could be disturbing archaeology. So right. there's a series of resource concerns in addition to the moral right. know, hard line. I loved dressing up as a soldier, as a seasonal ranger at Fort Warner. That's right. most of my time was spent in the blue wool of a post-Civil War infantry soldier. And I think the intent of it is the costume and all the accoutrements, the rifles and whatever, right. are helping you tell a bigger story. Right. And in the, this is going to have some resonance with what I'm doing now. Yeah. You know, in the late 60s and 70s, this became a very popular method of telling history. It, Okay. It has some limitations, and we'll revisit that, I think, as we continue to talk. Right. Fort Smith, I'm doing the graduate program at the University of Oklahoma, and in the, in the midst of that, I had the opportunity to participate in a seminar with Dr. Edward Linenthal okay. that, that explored how violence was re is remembered in the American landscape and in American memory. And that seminar was a pivot point for me. Oh, interesting. And, and Fort Smith National Historic Site is a, it's a complex place. And if you're watching Paramount Plus shows right now, huh. this last week, you know, the, the show Lawmen, Bass Reeves started airing episodes that's based at Fort Smith. It's a post-Civil War story about an African-American, you know, law enforcement officer. And Fort Smith, you know, every national park has this sort of weird thing about it. And one of the stories Fort Smith can explore is the history of frontier violence, frontier law enforcement, and mm. 19th century capital punishment. Oh, my. And Fort Smith is the only national park with a gallows. And it may be the only national park with a clear opportunity to talk about capital punishment and the contexts around it. Doing, wow. you know, I have worked in some odd places with stories of, quite frankly, escalating levels of violence in right. American history. The most difficult place I've ever stood and tried to tell a story is the reconstruction of the gallows at Fort Smith. Yeah. Because to get there in the late 19th century, you committed a crime, rape or murder. You know, you were tried mm. by a federal court and then you are put to death by the United States through the act of hanging. And oh, you know, wow. so it's just layers of violence. Yeah. And, and these 
central questions about constitutional law, law enforcement, justice. And the seminar with Ed Linenthal was really, really wild. It, mm. it was a cool opportunity. I went, I want to do that. And then through the end of it, you know, because like, hmm. <laughs> that seminar was in 2000. And as the Oklahoma City National Memorial was being constructed and a couple months before it was dedicated, one of the things we did in the seminars, we did out sort of the backdoor tour of the whole place. And you know, Oklahoma City is up today the National Memorial is an affiliated area of the National Park System, which is a, it means it's sort of National Park adjacent. And that's a modern site of violence that can be, you know, it's relevant to a lot of things and, and very what is difficult it, the Oklahoma? to talk. Oklahoma City National Memorial. It's the site of the April 1995 bombing of the Alfred Murrah Federal Building by Timothy McVeigh. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that was being built as a national memorial while you were in school? Yeah. Okay. okay. Wow. Yeah. That's, you're getting... You're experiencing a lot of, and it's interesting because, again, the national parks themselves, I think, get a lot of recognition and highlights. Then a lot of the additional sites within the Park Service do showcase some of the, like, like hardship or pain yeah. of our history. And so, yeah, you're getting a unique perspective of the history and getting to tell the stories of these things. And in that seminar, one of the other grad students in it, her father lost his life in the bombing. And so oh that... That feels hard to was, study that. Or maybe, it, you know, I don't know. I can't speak for her, but maybe it was healing in a sense also. It was healing. But, you know, again, this is a very, two, you know, year 2000 thing. I One of the discussions I had with her at the time, the X-Files movie had just come out. And the front of that film features a sequence that mimics the bombing of the of the federal building in Oklahoma City. And I, I said, oh, yeah, man. do not watch that. It will be trauma inducing for you. Right. Yeah. It was trauma inducing for me because the summer of 1995 was when I entered federal service as a season park ranger and little Fort Larned National Historic Site. Had a, we had a bomb threat plan, and there was a lot of sort of discussion in the cultural zeitgeist around federal employees, mm. and, and so that kind of set a temperature or a tone. So I know one of the places you were superintendent was Minuteman Missile National Historic Site, which we touched on briefly, and I actually, you know, in researching this again, I'm continuing to learn of different sites within the Park Service, and for those who aren't familiar, but this is an area that has a museum and highlights Cold War and the development of nuclear weapons. So then it's like, I'm reading about that. And then I'm thinking of Oppenheimer, which I still haven't seen, but <laughs> you know, to make this like a little pop culture reference, I was thinking it would be interesting to kind of share your experience there. And then did, was it referenced in Oppenheimer? How does it tie into our history as the U.S. with regards to nuclear weapons? There's a passing reference to the Minuteman system in Oppenheimer, because the interesting thing about that film is today in the national park system, there's exactly two bomb parks. There's Miniman Missile, and then Manhattan Project National Historical Park is a single park in three places. Oh. And one unit is in Los Alamos, New Mexico. One unit is in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And then the third unit is in Hanford, Washington, you know, 100 miles to the west of where I grew up. And, and the difference between the two is Manhattan Project tells the story of the development of the atomic bomb during World War II. And so they kind of hard stop in August of 1945, whereas Minuteman Missile picks up the story and carries it, quite frankly, to the present day. And because that park was created, you know, in the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War. But you, in this moment, right now, as we're talking this morning, the United States Air Force is maintaining 400 man three missiles on ready alert, ready to go, like they've been doing for 60 years. And so while the Cold War is over, the role of nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence in America's defense portfolio is not over. And so Minuteman Missile is this really interesting place because it, the park partially exists because as the Air Force was dismantling the South Dakota Missile Field in accordance with the START Treaty in the mid-1990s. What is a missile? What do you mean by like a missile field? So the, the Minuteman system was nuclear deterrence through wholesale. And I'm going to use I'm going to use a coffee analogy because it's morning. We've had our cups of coffee. Right. Of course. Early missile systems in the 1950s, Atlas Tight Nike, they're liquid fueled missiles. They're designed, you know, note here, they're designed by German rocket scientists that we pulled from Germany mm. at the end of World War II. They're the Starbucks of nuclear deterrence because you, you know, you're like, oh, 
we need, you know, we need to shoot a, a, a Titan or an Atlas E missile. So you okay. pull it out of its storage, you put it upright, and you start fueling it. So that process takes up to 30 minutes to an hour. A Minuteman missile is solid fueled. And so it's the Ready in a minute? Keurig. Yeah, it's the Keurig of nuclear deterrence. You pop them in a silo and it's just, you know, essentially putty that the moment you light it, that missile goes, it goes from zero to 15,000 miles an hour within about a minute. And the way the Minuteman system worked was you, you'd have one control center and then about 10 miles away from that in a ring and about three miles from each other, you'd have 10 silos. And the silos are all connected through a underground computer cable system. And the way a missile field was de deployed was you, you were transforming in the 1960s, World War II air bases into these hubs for mi missile systems. So you'd have a, see. an Air Force base and then scattered around it over something like 20,000 square miles. You'd have, you'd have a missile squadron and within the squadron you had five flights of missiles. And so that's a flight is one control center, 10 okay. missiles. Okay. A squadron is oh my gosh. five control centers, 50 missiles that are, you know, again, 10 wired together, but all 50 are wired together, and there's right. some reasons why. And, and then a missile wing is a, at least three squadrons, so 150 missiles. Okay, wow. And for 30 years, oh the missile system was 1,000 silos and missiles ready to go, you know, built during, designed while Eisenhower was president, right. and then built while Kennedy and Johnson were, were in the White House. One of the concepts here for the Cold War that's, again, still part of America's nuclear de defense is this idea of the triad. And what we refer to, what we're referring to is how you deliver nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And there's three methods, by plane, bombers, by submarine. Right. And those are s smaller ballistic missiles. And right. then the Minuteman fleet, which is intercontinental ballistic missiles that go 15,000 miles an hour. Yeah. And they were most of those missile fields were in the Great Plains for a okay. couple of reasons. Not a lot of people in the Great Plains. Right. And and also those missiles would go up and then they would pivot and go over the North Pole because they were targeted to places within the former Soviet Union and China and other places. The kind of a quick like this is my personal exposure to this world because I think, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. I live in a bubble and, you know, it's like a little intense. I'm It's intense to like think of all these things and but I was in Hawaii when uh, yeah. accident ballistic missile threat was released and yeah. to me for those who are not aware or who have not heard of it it essentially was like uh, it was supposed to be a drill but they yeah. accidentally pushed the red alert button of a missile will impact sea or land within 10 to 15 minutes. And that alert went out to everyone in Hawaii. And it was pretty, I mean, I've told many people about this. If, you know, people know me, like just kind of the like sociological experience of like seeing there were 10 of us together, seeing how everyone reacted and our experiences with that. But it was the like ballistic nuclear world had never felt yeah. closer than then in that moment. And it was it was very jarring, and I'm sure you, having worked at Minuteman Missile National Historic Site, are much more entrenched in, I mean, even in our conversation, you obviously have eons of more knowledge than I do in yeah. this area, but just from my, like, bubble experience, I was like, oh, okay, this is, mm, this is, yeah. wow, these are real things that are very scary. Yeah. And Minuteman Missile was 100% a dream part for me. I was at the beginning of my career when it was authorized. And my wife would tell you, I went home sort of, oh, man, oh. I want to work there. Oh, and so cool. It, it's perhaps the most extraordinary resource preserved in the national park system mm. because the, you know, so there's a visitor center and that's fine, but it's, it's necessary because it, there's some things you have to explain for people to make sense of this. And then four miles from that visitor center is Delta one, the, a launch control facility, which from the, from the highway, it looks like a ranch house where maybe somebody really paranoid lives because it's got weird antennas and, and it's got <laughs> a fenced perimeter and a helicopter pad and signs on the fence that say, you know, danger restricted, use right. of deadly force authorized. Wow. And yeah, which... You're like, bro, chill out. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then 10 miles further to the west on Interstate 90 is Delta 9, a single preserved, fully preserved missile silo of Delta flight with wow. a unarmed, unfueled missile in the silo. And you know, visitors don't get to go in the silo because it's smaller than you think it would be. Mm. But there's a glass structure over the top of the launch tube. So you walk 
to it and you look down at a 55 foot missile That's okay. looking at you and when <laughs> I don't you look need to up, do that. <laughs> the Badlands National Park, Badlands Wall is in the distance. There's oh you know, prairie grass is blowing in the summer, meadow larks are singing. And so the cognitive dissonance of a weapon of mass destruction and, and then this just wow. amazing prairie landscape can be wild the cognitive dissonance just makes me think of the day in hawaii because (laughs) we like had this moment honestly where we thought we were gonna die and then truly we were on our way we had been backpacking in hawaii volcanoes national park for the past like eight days and then this was our last day everyone was flying out this night And we had a catamaran swimming with dolphins tour and it, so it's just the cognitive dissonance of having a, like what we thought to be a near death experience, obviously like nothing, thankfully it was a false alarm, but just the fear of thinking, okay, this is it to then being on this boat on, on a catamaran, shall I say on probably one of the most beautiful days ever. And like swimming with these dolphins in the bay and like, you're just like, what, what is this? What is life? That's so weird. So I can imagine looking at the like destructive um, missile with the backdrop of such a gorgeous landscape. You're just like, what? Juxtaposition is just too much. The practical question that is this, this is a resource, a set of facilities that were built in 1962, designed between 1957 and 1960 to execute a a nuclear deterrence mission, they were never, ever meant for tourists, ever. It, yeah, and, that's fascinating. And so how do you manage that? And underground control center at it, 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 it Delta One, it's a 1962 elevator that it's three, the car is three feet by five feet because it was designed for two people to go, you know, go down. And so tours are one ranger and up to six people. And man, you're packed in that elevator. And so it's, well, it it has an interesting effect on people because it starts to ramp up your tension a little bit. You go down. Yeah, it's like a full immersive experience. Yeah. And you get at the bottom of the elevator, you walk out into this tunnel junction. And on the wall next to you is a piece of art painted by an Air Force officer in 1988 of a Minuteman missile bursting through a Soviet flag. And then, oh on the, and then 10 feet from that, oh. on the five-ton blast door that secured the control center is a piece of art painted by Tony Gatlin, a lieutenant in 1990, and that, that has become iconic as a symbol of the American Cold War. It, you know, it's a square piece of art on a square door that says, you know, it's mimicking a Domino's ad of 1990. Worldwide delivery in 30 minutes or your next one is free. And, you know, the pizza box has, it's got a Domino's pizza box and it's got a Minuteman missile on it. And oh my gosh. It's <gasps> dark humor because that, no, I mean, that it was a dark was... time though. That I'm just thinking of my like parents as you're talking because yeah. they grew up in the... They were both born in the 60s, and especially my dad just talking about, I feel like he shared a lot about kind of his experience growing up in that tension, and I think he was in Berlin when the wall was still up, and so kind of, it's just interesting to be thinking of these things, and I'm like excited for them to honestly listen to this. It's just, yeah, that's, I mean, that's dark humor. (laughs) That morale art was... You know, likewise, it was never meant to be seen by us. And I had this one of, the, one of the employees that worked for me, her daughter-in-law was Russian. And when she brought her daughter-in-law, and I had a similar experience with some park managers from Mongolia, one of mm. whom was about my age and had gone to university in Moscow. And they looked at that, the art with the Soviet flag and the missile going through it, and uh, they had a visceral reaction, which yeah. is not the same as you and I would have. I mean, it was the yeah. polar opposite. And it, and it, you know, and so Minuteman missile is this funny park today because it's you're on Interstate 90. You're, you know, most people that go there happen on it. They don't plan to go there. Right. They're, Maybe they're yeah, on their way to Badlands or something. They're on the, well, they're on their way to Badlands, Mount Rushmore, Yellowstone, or Glacier. They're on the oh. Great Western Road Trip, and they they're like, hey, what's this? And, and then they're like, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> they and, see the delivery mural, and they're like, what? And, you know, and just, you know, I during the, you know, the big eclipse in 2017, I I remember at one point, you know, it, I hear over here a couple of visitors, you know, at the time, the park film was, wasn't was finished, so we were showing, a, like, a three-minute trailer in the theater of it, and these guys come out, and they're like, oh, my God, that's, that's scary shit. What park? 
all of it. And well, and then like a day later, that big eclipse brought people to the Midwest who would otherwise never come to the Midwest. And so a day later, there's this mother push, literally pushing her kids out the door going, there are 400 missiles. You know, how I make sense of our success in national parks is to me, we succeed when, and this is true of any national park. Right. If when you're done, you've seen America in a way you've never seen it before, we've succeeded. And yeah. you know, the there's an immensely relevant story about and it, and missile because it's it's really the central constitutional question of what are the choices we make as a nation right. you know, to provide for the common defense and about the general yeah. welfare. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm thinking exactly <laughs> the preamble. I don't know that it's from a workforce perspective. Not every ranger is going to enjoy working at a place where you know because. When you stand there, you're standing at a site that once held the power to erase a city off the face of the earth. And that right. that can that can be hard Intense. to grapple with. Well, when I interviewed for the position at Minuteman Missile, one of the questions I was asked was, why do you think you're the right person for this job? And my answer was perhaps a little trite, but you know, at the time I was the interpretive manager at Andersonville National Historic Site. What I said very quickly was, you know, after four and a half years uh, managing you know, the interpretive program at Andersonville National Historic Site and burials mm -hmm. at the Andersonville National Cemetery, and Andersonville being the deadliest place on American soil, the, the Confederacy you know, oversaw the, de the confinement of 30,000 United States soldiers and the deaths of 13,000 of them at Andersonville mm -hmm. in a 14-month period late in the American Civil War. Been there, deadliest place in American soil. What's really left for me but a nuclear armageddon? <laughs> you feel and, like if I'm going down that trajectory. Yeah. And so there was 10 or 15 seconds of silence, and then there was sort of nervous laughter, and, <laughs> and it worked. I mean, yeah, and, you got the job, so. You know, I got to do, you know, I got to finish sort of the establishment of that park, finish exhibits, finish the park film, complete the infrastructure that allows visitors to see a thing that they were never meant to see. And, yeah. and I, I miss it. You know, that staff, I communicate regularly. They continue to do really, really great work that not a ton of people notice. And as a manager, that's one one of the things that you know, you want to take care of the staff and that, right. you know, that little park you know when i was there there were five to seven of us in the winter and then we almost doubled our staff in the summer for four months so it's a really small team and you want to take care of the people that you work with yeah. because you know, that, that's how you succeed you touched on a point of why and i've said this many times but a continuing force of having these conversations is you know there are the big fish like yosemite and yellowstone and i think even in those parks there's so much that's done that goes unnoticed that I want to be highlighting and then expanding that to the park service and the park system in general. And like you said, it's those teams that are doing really great work and sharing these stories uh, that maybe don't get a ton of recognition. And so it's exciting for me to, one, learn about it and be like, that's awesome. And then two, create a platform for these conversations. Moving into Guadalupe Mountains National Park, I've been excited to hear your thoughts on this just because I did grow up in Austin and I'm like, yeah, Texas National Parks, <laughs> we love it. So you and I had mentioned before we were recording uh, the kind of interplay between Guadalupe Mountains National Park and Big Bend. And my yeah. two kind of preface this conversation, like I actually haven't been to Guadalupe Mountains National yeah. Park, but I've been to Big Bend. And I think that kind of yeah. shows some of what we were wanting to highlight in the first place. Well, it's worth noting up front that large-scale public lands and national parks in Texas are unicorns. They shouldn't exist. I have a funny caveat of that because my parents aren't from Texas. And like when we first, you know, and people are like, yeah. Texas pride is runs deep. And so when we first moved here, or just, I mean, in general, people are like, oh, we moved here when I was eight. So I've spent most of my life here, but, you know, they had spent a big chunk of their life not in Texas. And everyone was like, oh, uh, Texas is amazing. I let you know, like, aren't you so blessed to be here? All these things. And when I was going to Big Bend, people were like, it's amazing. And I kind of was like, I had really low expectations because I was like, I don't know. Are these people just like being, it's amazing because it's Texas. Like, you know, like I was like, are yeah. they putting on their Texas <laughs> binoculars and being like, I love this place. It's amazing. And then I got there and I was like, oh no, this is actually, you know, take the Texas pride out of it. And it's on its own, an incredible yeah. place. But yeah, jumping back to what makes it unique from your perspective. Well, the Texas pride is important because you know, when Texas entered the union, the, the state held on to its public land. So federal oh. land, you know, 
essentially didn't exist. So the short version of the story here is in the case of any national park, but especially Big Bend at 800,000 acres and Guadalupe Mountains at 86,000 acres, people within the state of Texas, Texans, said these things are so important that they need to become protected federally. And it's a huge deal. And the creation story of each park involves a couple of Texans who are like, this matters, we have to do this. And the both Big Bend and, to a lesser extent, Guadalupe Mountains, because they they are the giants in terms of public land within the state, they, they have an outsized influence in how both the state views itself and then how outsiders view the state. And Because I think you would agree with me that Big Bend does not actually reflect what most of the state of Texas looks like. Oh, no. My God. <laughs> I was like, and when you're driving out there from Austin, you're like, I mean, it's flatlands. Yeah. You know, tumbleweeds, oil rigs in the background. And you're yeah. like, I don't really. How is this going to be? Some beautiful, (laughs) magical place. Then it is. Yeah, it's like, I mean, and similar with Guadalupe Mountains National Park, I envision like to even think like, oh, there are mountains in Texas. Like what? Well, and so I worked as a field ranger in the early 2000s at Big Bend. My youngest right. child was born while we lived there, oh, cool. which was its own interesting complexity. Right. The when the job came open, you know, I was looking for sort of the next thing and you know, and I, I looked at my wife and said, We know what West Texas is what like. We quite frankly, we really like it. Yeah. You know, and and her response was, Well not why not try the lottery? And I, I didn't figure I would even be considered for the position. And and a lesson there is I think perhaps I was I was setting my sights too low. And what a gift Guadalupe Mountains was. You know, it's the largest and oldest federally designated wilderness area in Texas. Oh, Inside oh. that eighty six thousand acre park are eight of the ten highest peaks in the state. And and so, you know, not, nice. not to throw shade, but I'm going to throw shade. Um, you have love Big to. Bend. Big Bend is extraordinary. Right, you know, of course. Big Bend is defined by big expanses and then, you know, these sort of, you know, you have these low country, you know, desert sp- spaces and then pop, you know, a ridge line or a mountain appears in Big Bend. And that's metastasized at Guadalupe Mountains because the low end of the park is you know, around, you know, 3,000 feet above sea level on the west side. And Guadalupe Peak inside the park, the highest point in Texas, is 8,751 feet above sea level. So there's, you know, there's a, a, ver- a vertical mile of elevation change. And the west side of the mountains is is, is a three to 4,000 foot straight line, you know, limestone escarpment that if you're to the west of the mountains at sunset, you know, the setting sun lights it up it's That's so awesome most visitors don't see that because all of the the major trails are all on the east side of the park and the east side of the mountains yeah i mentioned before we started recording but i was interviewing cam who's the superintendent yep. of yellowstone last week and he was mentioning i think it's some crazy stat of like and you even mentioned this like even being a mile off the road yeah. You're in the like wilderness and it's just crazy. And what you said with Guadalupe of like 80% of the park was closed, but it was almost as if things were functioning as normal. And so yeah. it's, I mean, it's hard because you want to see those like sites that are yeah. renowned and famous, but then for myself, I'm like, how can I experience some of the more rugged yeah. parts of these parks and get, get that, those beautiful views and images and experiences and also experience the like rugged aspects of it on the maybe lesser visited spots. So I relocated to Guadalupe Mountains in September. My first day was the beginning of September, 2020. And it took me a couple weeks to, as I was getting my sea legs to realize something was wrong. And, yeah. you know, because my first weekend, yeah, I went to town and went grocery shopping. And you know, and then I came back and I sort of drove through headquarters. I'm like, huh, this is a lot of traffic. And you know, during you know, all those pandemic era restrictions, things were closed. And so right. people were seeking outdoor places. And right. that was a pressure almost without precedent in the National Park Service's history. Yeah. I think a lot of people experience, yeah. like superintendents I've talked to, it's kind yeah. of, that was a crazy time. And, and so I pivoted pretty quickly. So I was I was working weekends with the yellow vest and directing traffic because mm. you know, the physical plant at headquarters at Pine Springs in Guadalupe Mountains National Park, it was designed in the late 70s for an America and use patterns that simply don't exist anymore. And right. the place was on the edge of being overwhelmed. 
there was a lot of you know, staff were stressed. And right. you know, this is going to sound slightly perverse, but what a gift the pandemic was because you, know, you could come in and go, the old rules don't make sense anymore and, and start just kind of have to tear re- up, you know, procedure right. and changing operations to, because what I realized very quickly was just how stressed the frontline staff, the fee collectors, the mm. interpretive rangers were, the law enforcement rangers, because they're managing crowds that are far above capacity. You know, we were working with our partners because the parking lots would fill, and while well, it's an 86,000 acre park and there's space, once you're out of parking, you can't, can't yeah. accommodate additional people. Yeah. And, and so we were you know, trying to figure out how to manage that. Another note about you know, Guadalupe Mountains, and to return to what we, what you and I said before we started recording, you know, Big, Big Ben, well, Guadalupe Mountains is this funny little park because it's today, it, it's in the middle of a circle of you know, four capital N, capital P national parks that it, those other parks are all sort of first tier places. White Sands National Park, right? Carlsbad Caverns National Park, Big Bend National Park, and then there's Guadalupe Mountains. This, which is because of when it was created, it's a wilderness park. There's very little infrastructure. You know, right. The emphasis is on you know the, the rugged trail system, and so its capacity is smaller, and that has an effect yeah. on how it's used. And so it tends to be the place that people drive past, or they you know they're, they're they. They go to it on their way to these other places. And, mm-hmm. and so that, that starts to affect how they even look at it. And the trap that Guadalupe Mountains gets stuck in that they didn't create is a couple about a month after the agency releases its annual visitation statistics, major media outlets will do this news media piece of, here's the 15 least visited national parks. Guadalupe Mountains is you know, near the, you know, it's not the least visited, but at right. now almost a quarter million, it's it's like at number 14 or 15. Okay. And, and so, but, you know, today during spring break or fall color season, if you show up on a weekend at 10 o'clock in the morning, there's been no parking for two hours. And mm. and so people would be like, well, this is the least visited. I'm going to do the, op- take an opportunity with you that you didn't do when you're interacting with people in a yellow vest at a road trying to get them to turn around. Right. That least visited frame, at best, it's unhelpful. At worst, it's toxic. Because think of national parks as your family. Mm, right. Oh, I'm going to my least visited aunt today. That feels insulting. It's not help. You know, again, with the complexity of the park system, there's a park for everyone. And right. one broad truism is people that spend all day at Carlsbad Caverns, they spend you know, one or two hours at Guadalupe Mountains. And, and that's because those two parks, I mean, they represent totally different extremes of the 20th century in terms Right. of preservation. Carlsbad Caverns, the main cave, it's not Disneyland, but it's a highly curated experience where you're walking right. on an as- asphalt trail 800 feet underground. Yeah. And then the other place, you're very quickly, you're by yourself. And in a landscape that's the, the plants are pokey and sticky. And you know, if you fall into them, they're, they're going to there's hurt scorpions you. and rattlesnakes. Yeah, <laughs> and rattlesnakes. And, and also not a single bit of water. You know, if you go, mm, one of the challenges for backpacking in Guadalupe Mountains is you have to carry all of your water with you. Yeah, we, I know that Big Bend obviously has like the Rio Grande and yeah. uh, so it has some water, but like when we did, we did a three day backpacking trip there yep. and we had to carry our water in it. I mean, it limits, yeah. granted we did a loop. So it's like, I don't think we intended to do longer, but when you have to carry your water, it limits how far you can go and how long you can be. Like, you know, when we were in Hawaii, yeah. we got to do an eight day backpacking trip because there were water tanks. I, don't, I think they were like rainwater tanks at the different campsites, but yeah, that's not possible at every park. Yeah. yeah the elevation is really what distinguishes Guadalupe Mountains because you're at headquarters, you're, you're the same elevation is Denver, so a mile above sea level. Oh, interesting. And you're hiking to, if you're doing Guadalupe Peak, you know, the so-called top of Texas, because Texans are humble people, of course. Right, yes, they are. If you're from, you know, and I'm not picking on anyone, Maddie, but, you know, if you're- No, I love it. If you're from Austin, (laughs) Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, you live at sea level, and so you've driven to- Guadalupe Mountains, and you're going to hike to to the top of Texas. You're you're starting at a mile above sea level, and you're going to gain three thousand feet. It's a pretty substantial hike. It's it's far more difficult than people think it is, right. and and so that has some consequences. And, and and that 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 trail has become in the internet age the most popular hike in the park. You know, if if I was permitted a ranger to make a recommendation, 
Unless you have to bucket list and, you know, check off highest point in Texas, the Kitcher Canyon is the best experience in that park. It's the most representative. It's the thing that inspired the preservation of that place mm. as a national park. Because you, and you, you can spend an entire day in the Kitcher Canyon. You can hike some elevation if you choose to, but you don't have right. to. And it's, there's 2,000 foot cliffs above you and the drones and just this extraordinary landscape that is not like anything else in Texas. I know we're nearing the end of our time and I want to <laughs> kind of talk about it's been yeah. great jumping into all these things but I do want to acknowledge your transition I believe this yeah. past summer to the High Plains group and yeah I would just love to get your perspective on you know it covers four different sites that are separated yeah. by some distance so kind of how do how have you approached these past couple months learning about these different sites and you know managing I know it's not new to the park system to be managing yeah. things that are separated like you know obviously yeah. The regional offices are at centralized yeah. locations, but um, yeah, I just love to hear about kind of your adjustment to this new opportunity and kind of what are things that are top of mind for you as you're ramping up or have ramped up? It's worth noting that the first grouped operation within the national park system was 99 years ago, and that was the Southwestern National Monuments managed by you know, Boss Pinkley, a very famous park ranger. And okay. you know, he was he worked at one particular site, Casa, Casa Grande Ruins National Monument, and he was managing all the other little national monuments in the Southwest. And, and that's like, it was over 30. And, wow. and you know, why do we group parks together? Part of it is to, because if you repeat you know, management structures at a whole bunch of little parks, you run out of, quite frankly, dollars to do the the real work and and so it's sort of about efficiencies and the high plains group is there's now three units within about an you know, about 75 to 80 miles but separating each of them in a triangle in southeast colorado mostly along the arkansas river but sand creek massacre is a little above it and those three sites have a very clear there's a narrative arc that connects all three of them right that, goes from the early 19th century into the mid 20th century and then you know, Capulin Volcano is this site to the, it's, a, it's the furthest away and it you know it's not close to anything it's a it's a really interesting park because it's a week or two older than the National Park Service is it was oh, established, authorized by President Woodrow Wilson in in August of 1960 and so it represents it has a lot in common with Devil's Tower in that it preserves a thing within a very small footprint Ben's Fort, in an acreage perspective, Ben's, Ben's Old Fort is actually a bigger park. Than, oh, interesting. Than this little cinder cone volcano. Yeah. Okay. And so I've been, as time allows and my schedule allows, I'm trying to, you know, sort of hit each of the places once a month. If I recall, I mean, in our email conversations, you were just at Capulin this past week, yeah. correct? Yeah. Yeah. I, I spent a couple of days down there and you know, sort of doing, so with a, a colleague, a superintendent from another group, looking at sort of operations and review. And right. And had a Capulin's an interesting park because most visitors, you drive in, you go to the visitor center, you go to the bathroom, you drive. There's a two mile road that goes to the toward the top of the mountain, and you're at seven, you're above seven and a half thousand feet there, and you have a really nice view. And there's a trail that goes along the the rim of the, the rim, crater, right? Yeah, yeah, that that goes above eight thousand feet and is just incredible in terms of views out onto the this break on the edge of the Rocky Mountains and the the oh, prairies cool. to the east. Yeah. Well, what I was looking when I was looking at images. It's really interesting because if people look up Kaplan Volcano National Monument, it's really weird to see a crater with trees on it. Like <laughs> that to me was very weird for some reason because yeah. I think it's just I think of these like volcanic craters being way above tree line or so it's like this rocky surface or I don't know. It's interesting because it's I'm assuming it's pretty sure it's dormant. So it's yeah, it's a it's very young. It's 60,000 years old. Oh, <laughs> very young. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's adolescent years. Yeah. And, and it, it's, it's because, again, elevation, you, you have the, all these trees at the top. And it, it's right. not unusual to see deer inside the crater. Oh, whoa. Yeah. A, a management challenge, that road. Today, we would never build, build a road up that mountain because the road, you know, it's, a, it's a road with cars on it on a cinder cone. And you know, there, there's a very expensive road project underway to, that's fixing at the cost of millions of dollars, about mm. 100 feet of road that failed uh, about five wow. years ago. Wow. And one of the consequences of that road is there are a couple places as you get close to the top where there's a history of deer jumping onto the road and getting hit. And we're rangers. We, 
that's not ideal for us. And, and so there's some, how do you minimize those risks to protect the wildlife and protect people? And, and, and so the, there's the, these retaining walls on the uphill side actually have these, they look like drainage features and they kind of are, but they're also meant for deer to come down the wall instead of jumping off Jumping of over. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of working with like yeah. to train, not train them in a sense, but just yeah. make their actions not consequential for them. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, what I guess what else with regards to, like you said, the other three sites kind of tell, you know, they're more historic sites yeah. and tell different stories of, I know I was reading, you know, there's the Sand Creek Massacre and then there's also a place where there was like an incarceration camp during yeah. World War II for Japanese Americans. So there's a lot of different hard stories that these places are telling. Very hard stories. And Sand Creek Massacre you know, is, is a really important park of the 21st century. It was authorized by Congress in 2000. And those laws oh, wow. require the National Park Service to work hand in hand with the four tribes, the Northern and Southern Cheyenne and Arapaho mm. that were at the village on November 24th and whose families were you know, personally affected by the acts of the Colorado volunteers under the command right. of Colonel John Shivington. And, and that in 2023, Coates co-stewardship with Native American tribes has become sort of a trend. It's Sand Creek. It's part, it's always how we've done business because right. to tell that story without the tribes is to fail. And then Amache National Historic Site is, is going to preserve as it stands up its operation, a, the smallest of the 10 major incarceration camps operated during World War II, mm -hmm. confining Japanese Americans away from the West Coast. And, and, and it, this, going back to this idea of a seamless narrative arc between those three parks, Amache is a, the formal name of the camp was the Grenada Relocation Center, but you'll notice we don't call it that. It's a work, you know, Consider this, it's a World War II Japanese-American incarceration site named for a Southern Cheyenne woman, whose father was murdered at Sand Creek and whose husband worked at Ben's Fork. And that park was authorized by Congress in the spring of 2022. As we talk today in early November 2023, land acquisition of most, but not quite all, of the authorized boundary of Amache happened about a month ago. And so we're in this Whoa. New gray area where technically, and the public doesn't notice this distinction, but as managers, we do, we're acutely aware of it. Amache National Historic Site in this moment is authorized, but not yet established. Oh, there is a site manager there and who's renting office space from a part of right. what we're waiting on is at some point in the next couple of months, we will receive what's known as an activation memo from the Secretary of the Interior. Oh. And, and and that memo will say, we I've determined that we now you know, own enough of the property to actually manage it as a unit of the National Park System. Okay. Mm, we're getting some behind the scenes. Yeah. And you know, at Minuteman Missile, I got to finish creating a new park. Here I'm at the front, you know, you know, at that very front end. And we, the foundation document, which defines the purpose, significance, the interpretive themes, and the fundamental values and resources, mm -hmm. that that document is in final review. That was developed before I came on board by okay. you know, a regional planning team, but in step with the survivor and descendant communities. And, you know, so Japanese Americans, mm. both on the West Coast and in Colorado and in other places okay. in the United States. Wow. You know, the, other, the other thing that sort of distinguishes Amache from the other Japanese American confinement sites is, and this is not being driven. You know, the Park Service is doing this. It's, it wasn't initially driven by us. And what a gift that is. The descendant yeah. and survivor communities of, at Amache see an affinity with the descendant community at Sand Creek Massacre. You know, they see that they are underrepresented groups, you know, minority groups within the right. United States that suffered on this Southeast Colorado landscape right. you know, at the hands of the United States of America, yeah. you know, yeah. a, an indignity of some of varying complexity. And so as we finish, you know, one of the things we've tucked in to that foundation doc is a a very short biography of the woman the camp is named for. You know, the it's Amache is the only one of those ten camps that's not referred to today by its official name because Japanese Americans can find there as early as you know the opening moments of the camp. They, you know, they called it Amache, and wow. they referred to themselves as Amacheans, and, and that, and so we're again, it's it's kind of fun to be able to fuzz the lines a little bit, and, and also acknowledge the tribes and work right. with tribes to sort to say, you know, this place is, you know, 
It's on traditional land. Mm. And well, it's on land that you know, Amache and her husband, John Prowers, r- ranched on about mm. 60 years before the, the, the site was you know, used during the war. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, it's fascinating kind of the different stages these sites yeah. are in as you've yeah. ramped up into this new position. A, a way that I like to finish off our conversation is understanding what is something you wish everyone knew about the High Plains group, regardless if they have or haven't been. Well, if, if you look at a map of the national park system, you might notice that the middle of the country is pretty bare. Mm-hmm. Americans you know, often dismiss the Great Plains states, the Great Plains as a place, as a as flyover country, but prairie landscapes, prairie environments, and the human histories on the prairie are, are incredibly compelling. I mean, it's yeah. a different kind of grandeur because you you can stand out in the middle of it. When you drive in between the sites, there are places where you're on the highway and you know, there's nothing on the horizon. It's just, and and yeah. that can be humbling. You know, yeah. he, Yosemite National Park Ranger Sheldon Johnson, I had the opportunity to speak with him as part of a management seminar a year and a half ago. One of the things he said to that group was, you know, the parks you haven't heard of are the parks you should prioritize to visit Mm. because they might tell you something that you, you, you're going to come in very possibly with very little expectation and come away going, whoa. And the, the High Plains group, the three Colorado units, that's, yeah. Trick question. How many national parks are there in, in the state of Colorado? No, they're not four. There's 13 of them. Yeah. And the high, the, the three in the High Plains group in Southeast Colorado are the highest concentration of national parks in the state. You came out here for a weekend, you know, you're, you're in ranch country and you can hit all three sites and get this really fascinating, again, continuity of story between the Santa Fe Trail and 19th century westward expansion to part of the pinnacle of that at Sand Creek Massacre in which we are driving the indigenous people of this place out right. in favor of white settlement. And then finally, right. further consequences of that in World War II. And those aren't they, they can be difficult stories, but they can also be inspiring stories. These Cheyenne and Arapaho people survived at great cost. They survived the Sand Creek Massacre. Yeah. Japanese Americans were transformed by the confinement experience on the uh, in Southeast Colorado and other places yeah. and persevere. And, and it's their efforts are what created that as a national park. And those yeah. are extraordinary places to come visit. Well, yeah, thanks for giving us some insight into that and for, I've had a great time learning about your past and just talking about all the different places you've worked and kind of what led you to each spot. So yeah, thank you, Eric, for um, your time. It's been great having you on the podcast. This This has been a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Thanks so much for listening today. Our music was composed by Danielle Bees. If you liked this podcast, rate, review, download, and tell your friends about it. This ensures the stories of our national parks and how they are run are shared. Listen to the other episodes wherever you listen to your podcasts or visit us at whorunsthispark.com to learn more. I'm Maddie Pellman, and you've been listening to Who Runs This Park.